John chapter 1. Read our text together. John chapter 1. Well, this has been a profitable day in the Lord. I trust for the ladies it's been a profitable weekend. Feasted much. Pastor Carl brought this morning a message on the fullness of Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk more about what he's full of this afternoon, but I find that I can't, can't get enough of that fullness. We can't be too full of that fullness, is what I'm trying to say. Um, all, all day Sunday, it's just a joy to be in the house of the Lord, feasting on the Word, and you throw in a Wednesday night service, I'll be here too. Can't, can't get enough of that. John chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, let's hear the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after Me ranks before Me, because He was before Me. And from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. May God bless the reading of His holy word. We'll go before Him once more in prayer. O Lord, our God, we come before You asking for Your blessing once more on our time together. We pray that You would, O Lord, help us to see, to comprehend more of the true light which You have sent into the world. Open our blind eyes, Lord, we pray. Make the scales fall off. We, we want to see Jesus this afternoon in His glory. And so we pray, Lord, would You send forth Your Spirit to take up this Word that He has inspired, that You would bless our time. Help me, Lord, in the preaching of the Word. We, we pray that You would uh, instruct our hearts, that our affections would be stirred up for Christ, that He would be more precious to us, that we would give Him more worship, more praise for, Lord, He is... Do He's worthy of more than we could ever give Him. But we do pray that You would help us to give Him what He is due. And so we pray this in His name. Amen. John chapter 1. Last week together in John 1, we looked at those who did receive the true light that came into the world, that God sent His Word. And their reception was due to the fact that they had been born of God that God had done a work in them. And that birth was not on account of human descent or human desire or human determination. We didn't contribute to the sending of the light and we did not contribute to the receiving of the light. It was all an act of God in us, in you. If you are a child of God, you have been born again by the living God. And you are His son, His daughter, by His grace, by His work and His power. God does not need, we looked at our bloodlines, He doesn't need our desires, He doesn't need our will and volition to cooperate with His grace 
in order to be adopted into his family. Some may find that despairing. I I find a galaxy of comfort in that. All the comfort from my soul in the truth that I can't do anything to make myself right with God. He does it all. But when he does it, he does it. And I can't undo it. That's all the comfort in the world right there. The Word became flesh. Verse 14 is our text together. 13 is what we looked at last time. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. We've, we've already considered the Word as the uh, term that John is using to refer to Jesus Christ. He is not explicitly named the Word as Jesus Christ until our text today. This Word that's going to become flesh dwell among us. We continue to read through John 1. It's going to be more clear this is Jesus Christ of whom He is speaking. But we considered before when we looked at verse 1 together and saw He was addressed as the Word there, He is the He is called the Word because He expresses, which is the purpose of words, He expresses the character of God to us, His creatures. And He is the true light, as verse 9 said, which illumines how God wants us to live the lives that He has given to us, these fleshly lives. And He must give us second birth if we are to do that at all. And so... He is called the Word in verse 1. He is called the true light in verse 9. But He is not inanimate or immaterial as we think of words and light being. He is a person. He became flesh. He's not inanimate or immaterial. He's a person. He's Jesus Christ. How would the Word express the character and nature of God to us. He would do it by becoming flesh. By taking on flesh. How would the Word shine forth the true light into the world? He would do it by becoming flesh. Flesh. And humans... Each one of us, all the way from Adam on down, each one of us, we were made in the image of God. Mankind is made in the image of God. He has uh, inherent value because of that. Which is why it is sad to see women prostituting themselves on the street, to see people cutting themselves, beating themselves up, and abusing this body in which we have been given to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And this flesh that we've been given... We are made body and soul in the image of God to reflect the person of God according to our creative capabilities. We can't reflect everything about God because He's God and we're His creatures. But we can reflect to some degree the character and nature of God. That's His expectation of us as we walk the Christian walk, as we follow His Word and follow the example preeminently of the true life, the true light, the Word, Jesus Christ. So what happens when you take a human form that was already made in the image of God and put God into that form? What you're going to have is someone who can is going to perfectly image God to us. God can never act below His perfections, says Octavius Winslow. I love that phrase. And so you put that God into human flesh, which is already made in His image, and the full image, what it looks like to image God to show forth His glory is going to be seen in that person. And that person is the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ. He is not only a Word, the Word, He's not only the true light, He's a person, He's the supreme person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. And by becoming flesh, the, the Word even more clearly expresses the character of God and more clearly shines forth the true light to sinful men. Yes, we had the law of God. Now we see, if God was a man, how that would be implicated over the course of a lifetime. In the lifetime of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Word did not have to become flesh. But He did so 
out of love for His creatures. Because He's full of grace and truth, as we're going to get to, Lord willing, at the end of verse 14. If the Word had not taken on flesh, there would be no second Adam to clean up the mess that the first Adam made and left for all his posterity, every one of us. There would be no second Adam. If he didn't take on flesh, there is no gospel, no salvation for mankind apart from the Word taking on flesh. And as Pastor Carl already said before earlier, he uh, had an excellent message this morning. If you weren't here this morning, I, I encourage you to go back and listen to the audio take advantage of Brother Lachlan's ministry, and it is a fine message. But he he did mention, I'm just going to repeat briefly, uh, as God, the God-man, Jesus Christ, He alone is preeminently qualified to represent God to man and man to God. He is the sole mediator. There's not a pope or any other religious figure that mediates between you and God. We're all made priests in the new covenant. And Jesus Christ is our great high priest, the sole mediator. We need no other. You don't come to God through your parents. You don't come to God through your pastors. You don't come to God through uh, any other religious clergy or hierarchy. You come through Jesus Christ and Him alone. And so, He represents God to man, man to God. And as God... He alone has the righteousness that sinners need to appease God. Because we don't have any inherent righteousness. We can try our hardest, but it's not of the will of man that we're born again. We we can't muster up this righteousness in us. And as a man, he is also qualified to suffer the wrath that is due to mankind for breaking the law of God. Man must be punished. Man, the creature, must be punished for the creature's sin. Blood of bulls and goats are not going to take it away. And so, he is preeminently qualified to suffer the wrath due to his elect, to his sheep, and give the righteousness he has merited in the flesh to his elect. And the exchange is made in the gospel. His sin, or his righteousness for our sin. Get it right. He has no sin. Scratch that. He is sinless. When we were in verse 1 of John, John, we remarked how some try to obscure the deity of Jesus Christ. They're called Arians after the the Arius, the false teacher in the 4th century, who taught that Jesus was definitely a man. He was a historical figure, but he was definitely not God. And so this teaching, uh, Arianism, has... um, come down to our present day in different ways in the theology of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and Islam and all these false faiths. Uh, But it is not just the deity of Jesus Christ that comes under attack. Absolutely not. The humanity of Jesus Christ comes under just as much fire as His deity. Uh, And so we're going to look briefly because the Word made flesh. John is... These aren't just sick... Five words that we are intended to gloss over. This is um, sublime truths we're dealing with here that John is making the point the Word became flesh. And men have tried to obscure this, they've tried to deny it, to get around it. But the Word was made flesh despite what others have taught. We're going to briefly consider some heresies that have emerged just so you're aware of them. If somebody comes along and tries to push this stuff. On you, you'll know to resist because false teachers are out there, and the ministry, part of the ministry of the church is to warn you of false teaching that is out there, as Paul did the church in Colossae, again referencing Pastor Carl's sermon. Um, so, one of the heresies is Apollinarianism. Apollinarianism. This isn't just technical stuff in seminary, this has uses, as Pastor will talk about with the little guys, for us too. Because some of these things, um, they, they sound right, but under the surface, you scratch it, it's not, it's not right. The 4th century bishop of Laodicea, Apollinarius, taught that Jesus Christ, at His incarnation, took on a human body, but did not take on a human soul. Because, according to Apollinarius, bound up in the human soul was free will, and sin can always be found where there's free will. That was his logic. And so... 
He made Jesus, well, he's something of a man, but he's not actually a man. He's, he's kind of missing the soul part because, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to redeem Jesus from his own work and not ascribe sin to him. And so, no soul, you're not a man, and that heresy has been one since it's uh, been labeled one since its inception. The idea that Jesus has a body but no soul. Then there's Sabellianism. This one is still somewhat popular today. You'll run into guys that still hold to this. Sabellianism, also called modalism. In the third century, Sabellius taught that God was not three persons, but one person who revealed himself in three different modes, as it were. And to the Old Testament Jews, he was Yahweh, the Father. That was the mode, as it were, that he operated uh, under. Then in the, um, to Israel, he, or in the, in the, as the Son, he came to redeem. In the, uh, the first century there, A.D., he was the Son, presented himself as the Son. But since Pentecost in the church age, he's presented himself as the Spirit. So modalism, and people, again, they try to protect God from himself and his own revelation. They say, well, you know, God in the Old Testament, he was this grumpy old guy who was always trying to strike out, you know, strike down, you know, Canaanite nations, and he just was mad at everybody. And then the Son comes, and he's gracious, and then the Spirit comes, and he's just like a little dove. And, and they try to, you know, obscure the, the, the revelation of God and, and try to redeem God from himself by... Um, making him out to be what he's not. So they deny the Trinity. They just, they just believe there's God in one pers- is one person manifesting himself different ways. Then there's Eutychianism, a 5th century heresy taught by Eutychus that the two natures of Jesus Christ were blended to become one. We've got some kind of hybrid here. And they become indistinct from each other. He's God and man mixed. And you can't really tell which is which. His view was formulated in response to another heresy called Nestorianism, another 5th century heresy taught by Nestorius, that Jesus Christ was actually, instead of a blended person, he was two distinct persons. And one was human, one was divine, and that at the, he could act as the divine and act as the human, but he's two persons. So if your head's swimming, i got one more. Then there's docetism, which is the first century heresy that got its name from the Greek word dokio, meaning to seem or appear. This heresy was uh, even prevalent in the Apostle John's day. When we went through 1 John, me and Brother David went through 1 John together. We dealt with um, docetism there. The idea that Jesus was fully God, but only seemed or appeared to have a human body. It was more like a phantom. Maybe, some kind of you know, ghost, but not the Holy Ghost. And so that, those are different views that have come down. There's one more, it's more recent, not an earlier one, but it's still heretical, the idea of kenosis. It's also called kenosis doctrine or just uh, kenotism, kenoticism, pardon me. And it comes from the Greek word keno, meaning to empty, that's found in Philippians 2 verse 7 where Jesus Christ is said to empty himself and they load that term up to mean that when the word became flesh he literally gave up his deity to take on humanity he couldn't be both at the same time so they say there had to be some kind of exchange made in order for Jesus to take on a human nature the divine nature's got to go and there's all kinds of problems with this too. In Scripture, we do not find that when the Word became flesh, at the same time, He ceased to be divine. Three reasons why this is unbiblical. Uh, number one, God the Son is immutable. And He cannot cease to be God. I mean, we, the Catechism kids said it for us. He's eternal. He's unchanging. In Hebrews chapter 1, in Hebrews chapter 1, which opens up about God the Son, this very word, logos, we're considering in John chapter 1. If we go to Hebrews 1, we, we learn of God the Son that He is immutable and He cannot cease to be God. Verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my Son, today have I begotten you? Or again, I will be to Him a Father, He shall be to me a Son. 
verse 6. And again, when he, brings all, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And of the angels, he says, he makes his angels wind and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And then verse 10 says, still speaking about the Son, and you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Sounds like it's from John 1. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. And like a garment, they will be changed. But notice what he says in regards to the sun. But you are the same. Doesn't change the sun. You are the same. And your years will have no end. Your years will have no end. So God is immutable. God the Son is immutable. He cannot change. He cannot give up being God. He's immutable. And then secondly, post-incarnation, the Word, Jesus, manifested a number of divine attributes. We'll just look at three briefly. Uh, first is His omnipresence. In John chapter 3, back to our... Gospel of John, John chapter 3, uh, verse 13, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And so, he is, he is omnipresent. Yes, His body is in one place, but God the Son is still omnipresent. And He's also omniscient. He, he's everywhere, he's, he's omnipresent, but He's also omniscient. He knows all things. Let's look at Matthew 9, Matthew chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Jesus was omniscient. He knew all things. Matthew 9 and verse 1, And getting into a boat, He, that is Jesus, crossed over and came to His own city, and behold, some people brought to Him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Take heart, My son, your sins are forgiven. There's another evidence of deity, that He's God. He has the authority to forgive sins. But notice verse 3, And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. Verse 4, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And healed him. So, why do you think evil in your hearts? You know, 1 Samuel 16, 7, we know that the Lord is the one that looks on the heart. Well, here's the Lord right here, Jesus Christ. He knows what's in the heart of man. And, and in these particular scribes, there was evil in their hearts. They were thinking evil in their hearts, that Jesus was blaspheming. And then one more that we're going to get to, Lord willing, here pretty soon. Um, if I can get more than one or two verses in a sermon, John chapter 1, verse 48... John 1, verse 48, when Jesus is calling His disciples to Himself, verse 48, Nathanael said to Him, that is Jesus, How do you know Me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. So he's omniscient. He knows all things. He knew where Nathaniel was before Nathaniel knew who he was. And then omnipotence. He has all power. Mark 4, when he stills the storm. Who is this that the winds and the waves obey him? He has power over the weather. Because it's His creation. It's His created order. But then if you're still here in John, John 5, 21, the omnipotence, the all-power that Jesus has. 
John 5, 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. He has the power to give life. Second birth, to create life, natural or spiritual, belongs to Jesus. He has the power. And then John 10, probably in my opinion, the most audacious claim that's ever been made on the lips of any pair of lips ever. John 10, 17, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. To, to declare that in, alive in the flesh that you're going to go and then come back to take your life up again after you've died. I mean, if anybody made this claim today, it would be, seem to be foolish, but not for Jesus because he has power over the grave. Pastor Little dealt with in the Sunday school hour. The sting of death is, is taken away. It's broken. Power has been broken by Jesus. And then the context, we don't want to get too far away from John, but I just want to deal with kenosis because this stuff still runs around today. The context of Philippians 2 refutes the kenotic view. Paul has commanded and exhorted the Philippians there in, in chapter 2 to follow after the example of Christ's humility. That's his, his goal there in that passage. The Word was in eternity with God in need of nothing and receiving everything that He was due. Praise and honor and glory and worship from His creatures around His uh, throne in heaven. And it was not robbery, I like the term that King James uses there, it was not robbery for the Word to be equal with God because equality with God was precisely what He was due by virtue of being the Son of God, by virtue of being God the Son. And so Paul is not talking about an exchange here. He's talking about a subtraction by addition, if you will. Jesus didn't lose His divinity. He gained humanity. He didn't make an exchange. The Word took on the form of a servant and came as a man to redeem sinful men and women. He abased Himself from being the object of worship in all of heaven to being mocked and scorned by those He came to save. He didn't empty himself of his deity. He just showed how awful man's hearts really are. We can get the God-man here on earth, and what do we do? We hate the true light. We don't receive the true light, as John said. And so as far as Jesus Christ humbled himself, those who have been given life in Christ are to follow the example of his light, to follow his light, and in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's the point Paul is making there. And so each of these errors about the Word becoming flesh are condemned in the 5th the century Creed of Chalcedon, written in 451 A.D., uh, the words of which sum up the Orthodox teaching on the hypostatic union, that Jesus Christ is one person with two distinct natures, human and divine. They're unmixed, they're... Uh, Neither one is diminished, but he's fully God and fully man. So I'm going to read that creed to you, take a moment to read it. I, I tried to sum it up and, and abridge it somewhat. It just didn't work, and it's not very long. So uh, the Creed of Chalcedon, 451 A.D. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man of a rational soul and body, there goes Apollinarianism, coessential with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days, for us and our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Lord only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, without confusion, there goes Eutychianism, without change, without division, 
without separation, there goes Nestorianism, the distinction of natures by no means taken away in the, by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, the only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from, beginning, from the beginning have declared concerning Him, and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. I thought that was good language there in the creed of Chalcedon. So when John says that the Word became flesh, we want to be clear, he, didn't mean he, lo- he doesn't mean that he lost any of his divinity. If his divinity could be lost or even exchanged, he wouldn't be God. And so we must bow before this mystery. I can't wrap my mind around it. Perhaps some of you can. But we bow before the mystery of the hypostatic union, that we have a God we can and do know truly, but not fully. And so we must worship God and thank God for what we can comprehend. And for what we cannot comprehend, we worship and trust Him. So whether we know it or whether it's mysterious to us, He still do worship. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. And what did this flesh do? And dwelt among us. It's interesting, or at least I thought it was interesting, that, God, that John uses the Greek verb skeno, which means here to pitch a tent, to tabernacle among us. I thought that was very interesting. John is the only New Testament writer to use the term. He uses it five times, once here and four times in Revelation. In the Septuagint, however, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Scriptures, which were originally written in Hebrew, Uh, This Greek term is used multiple times in reference to the tabernacle. So, I don't know if the King James says tabernacled among us or not. forgot to check that. But that is the idea that, that Jesus Christ, this Word, has become flesh and is tabernacled among us sinful flesh. And here's the glory of God in our midst. Just as the tabernacle was the glory of God in the midst of Israel as they sojourned on their way to the promise land. Now the true light, as John writes, now the true light that casts those shadows in the old covenant is shining undimmed in the new covenant as the Word becomes flesh. The Word has become flesh. And the great humility of Jesus in His incarnation is only superseded by His humility in the cross. The incarnation was not an end unto itself, as glorious as it was. But the incarnation set him on the path to the cross, where his great, greatest display of humility was seen. The Word was in heaven, remember, face to face with God. The Greek there in verse 1, where only intelligent thoughts were thought. Only truth was shared. And... Not a moment was spent less than doing what ought to be done by all living things, giving glory and honor and praise to God. And the Word dwelt among us who hate the divine, who rejected the true light, who did not receive this light. But we were made to know and worship Him. And the Word did not come down from glory because the eternity of glory was monotonous to Him. Far from it. He came down to us because He's full of grace. He did not come down because eternity got boring or He wanted to play our ridiculous little games, chase our little trinkets, little fancies. The Word did not dwell among us because He finds human beings so interesting. It wasn't like, well, i got to hang out with them. The Word became flesh because He's full of grace, because He was going to seek a people to redeem for Himself who will worship Him and be made perfect by His power, by His grace, by His righteousness, His love. 
What is interesting is the character and nature of God. And the Word had been enjoying that very character and nature in the inter-Trinitarian communion that had not even begun to get boring for a moment from all eternity. But the Word dwelt among us. Among us. Not the angels, not the, uh, the creatures that surround the throne, but among us. So He could die an atoning death and leave us an example of the true light. The Word did not dwell among us because He needed us. The Word dwelt among us because we need Him. We need the true light. He doesn't need us. We don't add any light to His light. We need His light. Why would one face to face with God come down to pitch a tent with men? Because He's full of grace. That's why. It's the only reason why. Because He's full of grace. And He wants to manifest that to us. Only divine love and mercy, grace, could drive such a one from the status of John 1.1, 1, 1, being face to face with God, to the status of 1.14. He's pitching a tent among wicked sinners, filthy sinners. Only grace makes that transition. And we have seen His glory. Thank God He became flesh, pitched a tent among us. We behold His glory because of that grace. The, the Greek verb for seen here, I think I like the King James again, beheld His glory. When I memorize the catechism, I'm pretty sure it was King James, so I'm sorry if I'm confusing translations. But seen, beheld, the term here in the Greek is theomai, theater, theater. We have seen His Glory. John the Baptist in our chapter is going to cry out later, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Behold, come get two eyes full of this. Look at this. Here's the Lamb. Not a Lamb that was shed in the Passover time or at the temple. Here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Here's a theater worth going to. Get your ticket to here. Come see what God is doing in the Word becoming flesh. Here's what's what's worth our eyes turning toward, what God is doing. No more prophets, no more types, no more shadows. The main event is here. The Word is made flesh. The Word has come to dwell among us. The greatest story ever told live on the world stage, the Gospel. The righteous life of Jesus Christ being lived out. We wouldn't know it except... God inspired men like John to write this. So we don't get to see Jesus in his earthly life. I'm okay with that. I've got all eternity to spend with Jesus. And this book's going to satisfy me just fine before I get there. But the the glory that we have seen, I I asked Pastor to read Isaiah 60 with with, um, this in mind. Glory is very closely linked to sight. In the scriptures, Isaiah 60, I think, perhaps more than any other chapter, brings that out. If you'll turn back there, Isaiah 60. We think of theater, we go to see and hear things. We go to watch something, something whether it's a, a drama, a play, a movie, a, a concert. We go to see and hear things. Well, the glory of God is seen very closely linked to sight. Let's begin reading Isaiah 60 again. We'll read the first three verses and then verse 19. Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Verse 2, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of of your rising. And then in verse 19, the sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Glory. It's very closely linked with, with sight. And the glory of God is something that is seen. We may not see God Himself. He's a spirit. He doesn't have a body like men. But we do see the glory of God very much so, brothers and sisters. God has revealed His glory to every man in the created order. Romans 1 tells us they behold it. 
Now, what do they do with that truth? They suppress it because they don't want to believe in God. All their thoughts are no God, so they suppress that truth. But they, they perceive the glory there. The glory of God is seen in His miracles that He does. The glory of God is seen in His perfect law. The glory of God is seen in His gracious election and salvation of His people. And the glory of God is seen in His Word where He tells us of His character and nature, His mighty acts toward creation. And Jesus Christ exhibits each of these glorious truths par excellence. The Word, more than all of these things that came before, exhibits this this glory, this light that we see through Holy Scripture. John is not speaking, I don't believe, of merely beholding the glory at the transfiguration. That was no doubt glorious, where the veil was lifted back a bit and we, the, the disciples there, the inner circle of the disciples anyway, got to see the glory of God come down, Moses and Elijah there, and they were taken aback by it. Peter, who was one of the ones that was there, says we have even a more sure word in Scripture Something even more sure than seeing the glory of God at the transfiguration. I don't believe that's what John is referring to here. We've seen his glory, you know, the, the, the Mount of Transfiguration. I think it's the glory of Jesus' everyday life. In a fallen, broken world that rejects the light, that life would be glorious to behold. Glorious to behold. There was more glory in one day in the life of Jesus than in all the lifetimes of men put together. More glory in just one day of Jesus' life. And Jesus, of course, shows His power over His created order. We mentioned Mark 4 earlier. He walks on water. He still storms. He's got power. We see His glory. Disciples see His glory. We see it in Scripture. Just as sure as they saw it in time and space. The Word of God is that sure. He performs miracles, Jesus does, on a scale far surpassing all the prophets before. Elisha, Elijah, all of the prophets, Moses. Jesus surpasses all of them. Jesus embodies the glory of the law of God. The glorious law that that we meditate on day and night. Jesus embodies that. He is the living word that embodies the written word. And Jesus shows forth the glory of God by graciously forgiving the societal outcasts, showing His elect are not whom the world would expect. It wasn't the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought, you know, when Messiah showed up, they were going to get, you know, adulations and medals and ribbons and, you know, cabinets of trophies, and they didn't get any of it. They got rebukes. Jesus showed who were His elect by bringing in societal outcasts. Zacchaeus, who was a thief, prostitutes and harlots. And those were the people that Jesus came to save, that knew they were sinners and needed that Savior. They needed that true light because they'd been born of God, because they were chosen by God. And so Jesus shows forth the glory. The glory of God has never been more clearly seen than in the life of Jesus. We read the glory of God all through Scriptures. But there is something just a little bit more special when we get to the life of Christ in the Gospels. And it's like, oh, here's the pure fountain. We don't have to worry about any words of Jesus going, oh, well, well, that was, that was a mental hiccup there. No, we can take all that Jesus read and, oh, that's the living water. That's the pure word. That's the bread of life. That's the true vine giving nourishment to the branches. The life of Jesus Christ. He shines with glory brighter than any other subject. In the Bible or history, Jesus has more glory. And John writes, he does write as one who has seen firsthand the glory. And I'm grateful that he did. I love reading the Gospel of John. And John writes of it because to have seen the light is to tell others in darkness about the light. What God has done for us in opening our eyes. And so we've seen His glory. What glory? Glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Or as the ESV says, kind of, kind of wimpy translation, only Son from the Father. I was kind of disappointed in that translation. I like translating monogonase, the Greek term there, only begotten. Only begotten. 
uh, mono only special one, and then uh, genomai, the Greek verb to become. He's the only begotten son of God. And some people, you know, they may say only son. Well, then we go, but what about all the sons he's adopted that we just talked about in verse 12? That he gave the right to become children of God. So now, now I'm confused. Only son. But then some other people trip up on the term only begotten and go, whoop, whoop, whoop. So Jesus Christ had a beginning? You're telling me Jesus Christ had a beginning here? Nope, not at all. Um, only begotten doesn't mean that the Father procreated the Son. We have many fathers in this room that have procreated sons. Some like Wes and Kyle, only sons thus far, doing great, guys. But Jesus Christ has not pr been procreated by God the Father. Not at all. He's from everlasting. He was in the beginning with God. We, don't, we think of beginning in human terms, but the Son has existed just as long as the Father. You can never go in eternity past to a point where there was just the Father and not the Son. You, you go back as far as you want to. I, I know go back in eternity is somewhat redundant, but you, you get the point I'm trying to make here. You can't go back where there was not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you can't go forward to a point where they're not either. They've always existed with each other. The Holy Trinity. God, one God, three persons. And so, His, Jesus, being the only begotten means that He is distinguished from the Father, but He shares in the divine nature of the Father. Sons tend to be like their fathers. I'm glad I got the father I got. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be like him. I pick up the phone. Uh, we worked at the same job and pick up the phone and say, uh, you know, sheet music department. And they go, oh, hey, Clyde. You know, because I, I sound just like my dad. I heard a recording of myself the other day. I was like, I know I said that, but that's exactly how Diddy sounds. So sons are like their fathers for better or for worse. Um, they, they share in the nature and the character of the Father. And Jesus shares in the character and the nature of the Father. But He's not the Father. He's the Son. The Son that became flesh. And He is, one, one more uh, phrase in our, in our verse, He's full of grace and truth. Oh man, if these truths before were not sublime and divine enough, oh, full of grace and truth. Five Glorious words, full of grace and truth. And we'll talk more about the grace of God when we get to verse 16, because it's going to be grace upon grace there. But the grace of God, the subject never gets old, never get tired of hearing about the grace of God. The charis, the unmerited favor. There is nothing so good as being on the receiving end of unmerited favor. Nothing like that. No joy can compare. And from God Himself. It's nice enough when men do things to you that you don't deserve and you get the unmerited favor of men. But from God, unmerited favor for those that rejected the light until God did a work in them. And they were born of God. And then they received the unmerited favor of God. The unmerited favor of God. What would drive the Father to send the Son, whom He was enjoying communication with just fine in eternity, what would drive Him to send the Son into this world that He made, that, that, that rejected Him? The ones made in His image rejected Him. The animal kingdom didn't reject him. The planets didn't reject him. The plants didn't reject him. The ones made his image rejected him. And he sent his son to go die for him so he might save a people for himself and show forth more of his glory, more of his attributes of mercy and of this grace, this unmerited favor. That's all we're going to know of the favor of God because we haven't merited any of it. It's all unmerited favor that we enjoy because none of us can merit one single bit of favor with God on our best day. None of it. If it weren't for unmerited favor, we'd have no favor at all is what I'm trying to say. None at all. Even the chosen people of God, if we look back at verse uh, 10, His chosen people, they did not receive Him. They had been promised the light. They were told it was coming. They were told that the seed of the woman was going to crush the serpent. And when the seed of the woman came, they crushed him. They hated him. 
Oh, we're, we're, we're all lost and undone unless we get unmerited favor from God. We are a hopeless case apart from the unmerited favor of God. We have no favor with God. Here comes the heir. Let's kill him. Let's throw him out. That was us on our best day. The, the chosen people of God, they had glimpsed the beams. They'd been promised and they rejected the light. And if it wasn't for God working in him, us Gentiles would be no better off. Far from working to save us, human descent, human desire, and human determination, they've only served to reject God. And men put hope in those things that are only used to reject God apart from a work of God giving a second birth. And so into the midst of a world that would only despise Him apart from His sovereign love for them, His unmerited favor towards them, the Word came as flesh to be despised by those to whom He had given their flesh. Ungrateful creatures are we. Ungrateful, unholy, having no favor with God apart from His grace. And we, you know, as I was reading this, I was thinking yesterday, says He's full of grace and truth, this God that came down to us. You know what He should have come down to us full of? Wrath and vindication. That's what He should have come down full of. But because God is God and we are not, He is good and we are not, He came down full of grace, unmerited favor and truth. Unmerited favor and truth. His coming is an act of grace and He came full of grace. Such a one that was going to come, an act of grace would be what was driving Him. But only expect Him to come full of grace and He did come. Because we weren't asking for Him. We weren't asking to be saved. We were in love with our sin. Just fine with our one natural birth that we were wasting on ourselves. Wasting in sin and in darkness. Until the true light dawned in us. By the power of God. He's full of truth also. He's full of truth. This Word, the Word is full of truth. Jesus Christ. There are lots of untrue words out there. But this word is full of truth. Came as an act of grace. He did not come into the world to condemn the world. John 3.17 says, He came full of truth, full of grace to save the world. He is the climactic revelation of God. Hebrews 1.2 said, this word that's full of truth. In these last days, He, God, has spoken to us by His Son. And this word of truth, this word that He has spoken to us is true. It is truth. He, more than all the prophets before Him, has declared the mind of God to us. And has not only declared it, but shown it in His righteous life. He, more than any other, spoke the truth of God to man with clarity, boldness, compassion, with grace. With grace. He could speak no less than absolute truth because He is the Word of God and the Word of God is truth. Said the Word Himself in John 17, 17. Sanctify them in truth. Your Word is truth. Your Word is truth. What would you hope an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, eternal, and unchanging being. Oh, we got a big scary picture here. What would you hope that being would be full of? I can think of no better pairing than grace plus truth. We're talking about a being that is all-knowing. How would you want him to be to you? He's ever-present. He always sees what you're doing. He's eternal. You're not going to outlive him. He's unchanging. I I hope he has favor towards me because if he's not going to change, I'm doomed. Precisely. Precisely. Grace and truth. Can't get any better than that. Can't get any better. Grace that does not deal in truth is no grace at all. So don't hide your sins from God and pretend like they don't exist. Don't deal in untruths. Grace without grace that does not deal in truth is no grace at all. And truth without grace is brutal and harsh. Grace and truth. 
Two better things could you put together. He knows you and he deals truthfully with you. And how does he deal truthfully with you? With grace, unmerited favor. Why would you not want to deal with this God? Look at, his, look at what he's full of, the Word. Full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt, he took on humanity, did not lose his divinity, and he dwelt among us, his creatures who despised him. And we have seen his glory. We have seen his glory. Our depravity cannot overcome the working of God. We, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. The Son that came down from perfect intertrinitarian communication to our earth. Well, God's earth. He's full of grace and truth. Better than we could ever imagine Him to be to us. So, as Pastor Carl said, I can only give you the same three words. Go to Him. If you need favor with God, He has favor that... that you don't merit. The only favor you will ever have with God is favor that you will not merit. It's all the free grace of God in Jesus Christ in the Word that was made flesh. So go to Him. Avail yourself of this grace while you still have this flesh. Make a speedy use of Christ, as the Puritans would say. Go to Him. You need favor with God. He is full of it. Full of grace. Full of truth. We will close with a hymn together.